Thank you so much, worship team. How about showing a little appreciation for the uh, worship team? They did a great job this morning. My name is Jimmy Payton, and I am one of the elders here at uh, Solid Ground Church. A uh, couple of items before we start digging into the word this morning. Fifth graders, you can go to Solid Ground Kids. If there's any fifth graders in here, no, there's not. Okay. Okay. Um, second, I would like to say a big thank you uh, to Pastor Bert and Pastor Josh uh, for their leadership, their commitment to Solid Ground Church, and uh, for preaching the word. I mean, they, they bring it. And so Pastor Bert will be back. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Bert will be back next week. He's uh, doing a little relaxing, recharging. He sent me a couple photos from Bucky's. A truck stop. He was posing with Bucky. He was having a good time. Uh, so, okay, you have made it. Uh, you have made it to the end of Book of Romans. Uh, we started back in January, and we'll be concluding Romans today. So I think that's a <laughs> reason to celebrate. Uh, today's message uh, is entitled, Praising God, a Doxology. Okay, and we're going to get into it. So let's recap the book of Romans one last time, okay? Paul was the, uh, the author in the book of Romans. Um, he was on his, the, end, the, the tail end of his third missionary journey. And he wrote the book around Romans, or about uh, 57 AD. And so the book of Romans is a letter uh, to the churches in Rome in hopes to ground them in their teaching to sort out the disunity between the Jews and the Gentiles. And it was a letter kind of for a launch pad for Paul's future journeys or missions. Uh, and he wanted to go west. He wanted to go into Spain. So Romans can be broken down into three parts. Chapters 1 to 3 roughly deal with the problem of our sin, uh, our brokenness. Chapter 4 through 8 talks about the matter of our salvation. And then in beginning in chapter 9, all the way through chapter 16, you have matters related to the Christian life, uh, ministry, and just relationships in general. So let's dig into our scripture today. We'll be looking at the very last three verses in, in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 to 27. Um, I'd like to look at these passages, these three verses, in two different translations. First of all, the NIV, uh, and then we're going to go to uh, the Passion Translation. So, NIV, NIV first. It says in verse 25, Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus. Amen. So that was the NIV translation. Um, when you look at the translation, I really believe if you take a look at two or three different translations, it really adds to the depth and understanding of what the word might be saying to you. So we're going to read the Passion Translation now. I give all my praises and glory to the one who has more than enough power to make, to make you strong and keep you steadfast through the promises found in my gospel. That is the pro proclamation of Jesus, the anointed one. This wonderful news includes the unveiling of the mystery, remember that word, kept secret from the dawn of creation until now. This mystery is understood through the prophecies of Scripture and by the decree of the eternal God, and, and it is now heard openly by all nations igniting within, within them a deep commitment of faith. Now to God, the only source of wisdom, be glorious praises for endless ages through Jesus, 
the anointed one. Amen. So, when we read verses uh, 25 through 27, just like I mentioned in the sermon title, it's called a doxology. And so I know many of you probably grew up singing one of the more well-known doxologies. Do you remember? You can praise God. I can't sing it. Praise God with from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So, what is a doxology? A doxology is defined as an expression or praise to God. Most doxologies are short hymns or scripture in the Bible. The word doxology actually comes from the Greek words doxa and logos. So doxa means praise or honor or glory, while logos means word or speaking. So instead of the word doxology, you could say praise words or praise speak. So the Bible is filled with a lot of doxologies. Um, there are many times when the writers of Scripture just stop. And in the midst of all their writing, all their contemplating, and they just give their hearts to God in praise. So if you look at the book of Psalms, the Psalms were basically the hymn book for the Hebrew people. Uh, there are 150, a long book, uh, 150 separate Psalms in which they recited, they read, and they even sung these. Uh, the 150 Psalms, okay, are divided into five different books, okay? They speak about the attributes of God, the power of God, the work of God, the wisdom of God. And at the conclusion of each of these five books, it's a doxology. Praise speak, praise words. So I want to take a look at five of the doxologies in Psalms, uh, the five books of Psalms. So here we go. Put your seatbelt on. Going to go through some scripture here. Book one ends at Psalm 41, verse 13, and it is a doxology of praise that says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Book two in the Psalm uh, 72, verses 18 and 19, it says, Praise be to the Lord God, the, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Number three, the third book ends in Psalm 89, verse 52. It says, praise be to the Lord forever. Book four ends with Psalm 106, verse 48. It says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say Amen. Praise the Lord. Last one in Psalms. Book five ends in Psalm 150. Psalm 150 is an entire doxology. Yes, we're going to read it. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and the dancing. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything have that has breath praise the Lord. You've heard that one. Praise the Lord. So that was the Old Testament. Let's take a look at four examples in the New Testament. Remember, praise words. So when you come to the New Testament, you find at the birth of Jesus, the angels appeared on the scene, and what came from their lips was a doxology. Luke 2, 13 and 14 says, And suddenly there was with the angel a magnitude, multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. Another doxology in Luke 19. It's on Palm Sunday when Jesus came into Jerusalem as the Messiah, the predicted Messiah. It says all the people were shouting in verse 38, 
Blessed is the king who comes in the na- who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Ephesians 3 verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Last one in the New Testament that I'm going to give. Romans chapter 11, 33 through 36. Paul just stops in his thoughts and in his contemplation and he just praises God. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and, and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So a question for you. How often do you praise God? What's your doxology? What are your praise words for him? When do you praise him? Do you just stop spontaneously during the day and just something happens and you observe it and you're like, I want to praise God. Or do you praise him in times of trouble? I wake every morning, every morning, and I have my own little doxology. It's Psalm 118.24. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I need him. <laughs> right? Um, many of you know uh, Brother Roy Clark. He is an elder here at uh, Solid Ground Church. Have you ever had a conversation with Roy? <laughs> he, his praise word, his praise speak, everything pretty much comes out of his mouth is a praise word to the Lord. Have a conversation with this guy. I mean, hallelujah and amen. Uh, that's, I mean, that's what he, he pretty much always says. Um, I love him. <laughs> He's my brother. But you ask Jimmy P. And so Jimmy P, that's the rapper name my wife calls me, Jimmy P. Jimmy P, what up? You know, what am I going to get out of this message? Uh, this passage of scripture today in Romans 16 uh, through uh, 25 through 27. How can I apply it to my life? Three things. This passage captures three major themes. If you're going to write some stuff down, this is the first one. The first theme is God is able to establish everyone with the gospel. God is able to establish everyone with the gospel. First of all, Paul praises God for the gospel which establishes men. Notice in verse 25, it says, To him who is able to establish you according to my gospel. So what does it mean to him who is able to establish you? What Paul is trying to say here is, He, God, is powerful enough. He is wise enough. He is mighty enough to establish men. The actual word established means to set stab, uh, steadfastly in an immovable position. It means to confirm somebody, to root somebody, to plant their feet, to be mentally stable or founded. Okay, for those of you who are believers like myself, you know how it was before you became a Christian. Before you turned your life over to Christ and began to under, really understand the word. You are unstable, <laughs> and your foundation was probably built upon the things of the world. And we know that the world is broken, and there is definitely a struggle for truth, isn't there? Paul addresses this in his own life in Romans 17, verse 18, and it says, For I know the good itself does not dwell within me. That is, it is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Let's face it. 
uh, before knowing the gospel, right? This is what we would do. Without the gospel of salvation by grace, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, man has fallen. He is ignorant of the truth, and we are unstable and have no defense against, against Satan whatsoever. So the man without God is not established. The man without the gospel has no footing. He does not know what he believes. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, it says, always learning, people are always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of truth. Romans chapter 1 through 3 is all about the fallenness of man. In chapter 1, Paul says, he is under the wrath of God in verses 21 through 22. It says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasonings, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Romans 1, 28 through 31 says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up a deprived mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind. Hold on. Here we go. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Okay. Paul wrote Romans in 57 AD. All right. I'm going to pull my calculator out here. So 2024 minus 57 is 1967 years. Right. Um, so could you say 1,960 years later? We could use these same words today. Unfortunately, yes. Chapter 2 asks, is there a special favor for certain people to be established, to be founded, to be stable? Verse 11 says, for God does not show favoritism. Well, how about maybe it's uh, religious rituals that you go through or perform some type of religious formality. It is not. Verses 28 and 29 say, For you are not a Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. A, and true circumcision, cir circumcision, not merely obeying the letter of the law, rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. So what's he saying? A true child of God, a true uh, righteous person is not who does external religious things, but a person who has a changed heart. It is literally like a change from the inside When we're looking for deliverance from the fallenness of man, we don't find it in special favor or to a special people or performing a special formality. Deliverance is a change from the heart. How about good works, right? Will works establish us? Nope. They will not. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may no one may boast. No one is going to be right with God by what they do in terms of self-righteousness or works. So why does Paul why does Paul praise God? Paul praises God because he is established, he is able, very important word able to establish everyone with the gospel. The gospel is able to stable our minds on what the truth is. The gospel can set our course of action for life, and it can provide a path for right living. 
God is able to take the fallen man and lift him up and set him on his feet. God is truly our rock, our alpha, and our omega, the creator, and our strong tower. Hey, you know, like as we say here at Solid Ground Church, we are rooted in the spirit, or rooted in the word, powered by the spirit, rooted in the word, and powered by the spirit. So God establishes us first, and now he transforms us. Number two, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit transform us. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit transform us. Paul praises God for the preaching of Jesus Christ because it is the heart of the epistle. So from the end of chapter 3 all the way to the end of chapter 8, Paul describes the attributes of Christian living that comes as a wonderful work, a result of the work of Jesus Christ. In chapter 3, verse 20 to 20, 22 through 24, says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life for us and then went to the cross and died for our salvation. This is why Paul praises God, because Jesus transforms us, he transforms our character, and he transforms our identity. In chapter 5, Paul talks about peace and hope, and in verses 1 through 5 it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand established steadfast that's my words and we rejoice in the hope and glory of God not only so but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance character and character hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So let's talk about suffering. This is a tough one, isn't it? How can we be transformed in our suffering? Um, before we moved to Delaware last July, uh, my wife and I lived in Asheville, North Carolina for eight years. Okay? So as you know, uh, in the end of September, Hurricane Helene went through Asheville. And uh, all the places that I knew there, half of them were gone. <laughs> there was so much flooding and disaster. And I mean, we knew a lot of people that were impacted by that disaster. I mean, our hearts were broken and people's lives uh, were changed, definitely. Uh, my wife... Okay, I know some of you know her. She felt called to uh, collect a whole bunch of items. So she took a whole van full of items, collected some money to give to those people down in, in need down in Nashville. She witnessed the trip, or she went down and witnessed the trip and all the devastation. And, you know, it's one of those things where you just have to be there to really just the magnitude of it. Um, I, I love LK's heart. The way she encourages people and shows Christ's love through her actions. Uh, she, she was the hands and feet of Christ. And that's what transformation looks like. If you, if you observe something and you feel this pull or tug, it's the Holy Spirit. Act on it. It will transform you. Uh, uh, one of my best friends Ash, uh, down in Asheville, his name is Rusty. And uh, he's him and his family have been through a lot. Uh, within two miles of his house, he lives up in the mountains. There have been over 20 people that have died because of the flooding and the devastation. 
And so far, a total over 100 people have died, and there are a, a lot more missing still. But I, I talk to Rusty pretty much every other day, and I, I call him, and I said, hey, man, how you doing? And Rusty is a man of God, and he loves God so much. And every time he goes, I'm good. God is good. He knows God. He is a, a faithful disciple of God. He knows something better is coming. And that his actions by him saying that are a testimony and an encouragement for me. Because I look at him and I go, man, that's a God. That's a guy that has been transformed by Jesus Christ and the love that Jesus has showed him. So what are you currently working through? What are you suffering? Why do we go these things? I know that you ask that. But listen up, church. This is why. Because we know that God's ultimate purpose for us is to grow more and more into the image of his son. Trials and tribulations are in our life to enable us to be more like our Lord and Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a part of the process of sanctification, sanctification or just being set apart for God's purposes and to live for his glory. Again, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are continually transforming us. In chapter 8, Paul talks about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that comes to us through the gospel of Christ. Verse 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Paul then writes about the law of the Spirit, the walking in the Spirit, possessing the Holy Spirit, about the life the Spirit gives, the power of the Spirit to kill the deeds of the body, the, the leading of the Spirit, the witness of the Spirit, and about the guarantee of the Spirit that someday we are going to be going with the Lord. Hallelujah and amen, as what Brother Roy would say. We move on to chapter, end of chapter 8 and verses 26 through 28, and Paul talks about the interceding work of the Spirit. It states, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes, with, intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what's in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, everybody knows this verse, right? All things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Again, Paul describes the attributes of Christian living that come from, from the wonderful work of Jesus Christ. And all of this is because of the preaching and transformative works of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Last theme. Number three, God through the gospel has revealed a hidden mystery. Looking at the remainder of this doxology, doxology means what? Praise. Praise words. Yes, I heard you right. It is a gospel revealing mystery. And in chapter 16, verse 25, Paul writes, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been known to all nations. Mystery. So many Old Testament prophets predicted that the Savior will come, right? A Messiah, a deliverer a king. The scriptures of the prophets predicted it, but it was never made manifest. It was always hidden, and that's why it's called mystery. Okay, here's Pastor Burke's little geeking, greeking out session. The Greek word for my, uh, mystery is mousterion. Mousterion. That word is used 27 times in the New Testament and refers to something that can only be known through the divine revelation. 
because God himself reveals it. A mystery is something that was hidden in the Old Testament, but now is revealed in the New Testament. The mystery of Romans 16, verse 25, was made known by Jesus and the gospel. So you ask, what is the mystery? What is that mystery that is talked about here? Well, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, says it all. And this is God's plan or mystery. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. The mystery again is revealed in Colossians 1.26. It says, The message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches of glory of Christ are for the Gentiles too. And this is the secret that Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance, assurance of sharing in his glory. Chapter 11, verse 26 says, And so Israel will be saved, but not just Israel. It's beyond Israel. The desire of God is to have mercy upon all of us. The Jew and Gentile to be one in Christ, and that salvation is extended to all the ends of the earth, to all nations. The mystery was not something discovered or uncovered by Paul or anyone else. It was revealed by God when the time was right until it remained a, a hidden mystery for the long ages as generations of humanity came and went until the arrival of Jesus Christ. It was for the Jew and Gentile to become one in Christ that the salvation is extended for all. So from chapter 9 to 16, it's all about how the Jew and Gentile should have a, wrong, a strong relationship and community in the church, a place where both Jew and Gentile share with each other, serve with each other, minister to each other. It is a gospel that, re, that the, reveals a mystery, the mystery of Jew and Gentile together in great fellowship and love. So when you look back, at the whole entire book of Romans, Paul explains the relationship that we have with our Lord and Savior. In the first eight chapters, it's about a vertical relationship. The relationship between man and God, God and man, right? So then when you look at chapters 9 through 16, the relationship discussion changes. Paul talks about the relationships between we are here on earth. So this is really a horizontal relationship. Loving God is a vertical love. Loving others is a horizontal love. See where I'm going with this? Jesus showed his disciples how these two loves are intertwined in practical ways. You need both to affirm the cross. You need both to be strong. So in closing, Paul does give praise to God. Why? Number one, because we have a gospel that lifted us up and established us in righteousness. Number two, because we have a gospel that centers on the work of Jesus Christ, a totally transforming work. And number three, because we have a gospel that revealed a mystery that made salvation possible for everyone and anyone. So, if you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is a time for you to get established and be lifted up from your sin. And turn your eyes on Jesus and look at what he did for us on the cross and your behalf. Believe and be saved. You will receive the love and eternal life that comes from Jesus Christ. 
But so what's the message say to the believer? As a believer, I know you love the Lord. I love the Lord. But is your heart fully filled with praise towards God? Do you praise God every day? Do you praise him in times of trouble? It might be time to ask yourself, do you need to make a renewed commitment to be closer with Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just we praise your name. Holy, holy, holy are you. Father, we just thank you for your word and specifically the book of Romans today. As we went through that, that we can go closer to you in relationship. It says, Scripture says, if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Lord, I just pray for everyone here today that they will use these words in their lives and draw closer to you. Lord, um, guide us and judge us in your name. Amen. All right, as Pastor Bird always says, church, you are loved. And now take what you've heard and use it out in the world. And now you are sent. Have a great day.